Today, the concept of land appropriation is globally relevant. Across the world, in Israel and Ukraine, wars are being fought over it. So I thought on today's episode of Musings of Rin, I'd share a story that is a little closer to home in Canada. Since I will be talking about Canadian history, I feel it's important to describe some of my data sources to prove this isn't just some half-baked conspiracy theory. For some insight into the forming of the Elgin region, I looked at a book called The Talbot Regime, or the First Half Century of the Talbot Settlement, by C. O. Ermitinger. Ermitinger lived between 1851 and 1921 and was a lawyer, judge, and political figure in Elgin County. At the time of writing this book, he was a junior judge for the county of Elgin. The book was digitized in 2015 from a special edition donated to the University of Toronto by J. Stuart Fleming. It compiles personal letters and documents from the Talbot family to describe their viewpoint of what is going on in Elgin. For some insight into the Philpot family, there is a book called From Anvil to Pulpit, P.W. Philpot's Spiritual Journey, His Family and His Struggles for Ethical Integrity, written by David R. Elliott. I use this to understand some of the family history during this time. I also looked at a website on Malin Burwell's biography, when his name popped off as being a surveyor holding disputed lands. For other insight into the Elgin community, there is a series of books written by Hugh Joffrey Sims called Sims History of Elgin County. Sims lived from 1915 to 1952 and worked as a historian in Elgin County. The book tries to compile data from the community's history and talks about some of the more prominent families. There are three books in the series talking about the region, but I'm going to focus in on books one and two. I also cited a portion of the Origin of Elgin County Women's Institutes and their Tweedsmer Histories, written in 1925, digitized in 2012. To estimate salaries that would have been earned in this era, I tried to consider both British European influences as well as the American ones. One book I looked at was The Great Divergence in European Wages and Prices from the Middle Ages to the First World War, a book by Robert C. Allen, member of Nutfield College in Oxford. I also looked at Comparative Wages, Costs, and Price of Living, an annual report to the Massachusetts Bureau of Statistics and Labor for wages earned in the nearby American colonies, which they would have been competing with for workers. This was compiled by a Carol D. Wright. There were various newspaper publications during the year of 1869 and 1875 of the Home Journal. In addition, there were the digitized versions of the Elgin County Township papers used to understand how land was being allocated and transferred between individuals. Think of this as a curated collection of individual documents and maps talking about how the land was transferring hands. I also took a look at the Elgin County plot map from 1877 to get a feel for who owned the lands after the owned empty plots started getting snatched up. To track people within the region, I looked at digitized church records to track marriage and birth records, and digitized cemetery documents to track burials and death records. I also looked at the Canadian census for an idea of who, where people were living and with whom. And there are many more sources. If you're watching today's podcast, I would suggest you swap to the video because the visual aids I'm putting beside the explanation might help you better understand what's going on. But hey, it's up to you. The story contains corruption, intrigue, murder, and a little bit of history. So let's get into it. Our story begins with the Philpot family. John Philpot was a second generation Irishman from Nova Scotia. He was born sometime between 1780 and 1790. His father was an Irish soldier who served in Nova Scotia during the American Revolution. We believe the family originated from County Cork, Ireland. He joined the British Army during the time of the French-Indian War and later stuck around during the American Revolution. In 1803, we can see John came with Colonel Talbot to Upper Canada. It appears as if Talbot had hired some men to help him build out a new proposed settlement. Talbot had been granted 5,000 acres of land in Elgin County on the north bank of Lake Erie for being a field officer with the intention to settle in the province. We think he was offering workmen the chance to earn their own plot of land in returning for working for him as an indentured servant instead of paying the money outright. According to the Talbot regime book, in addition to his grant of 5,000 acres, 
he was told that he would be granted an additional 200 acres for every family of settlers who would be purchasing lots in and around his land. According to a letter enclosed by Simcoe, 50 acres would be purchased by the family, and Talbot would be freely granted 150 acres around that plot for the trouble of settling them. Therefore, the larger part of the family's grant would be rented from Talbot. This was Talbot's understanding, written as part of his application to be granted land in Upper Canada. So, how do we know John was one of these men? Well, in the historical books I consulted, Colonel Talbot was said to have arrived with four men to the banks of Lake Erie. Presumably, this was his indentured work crew. John Philpott was mentioned as being a foreman on at least one of his initial building projects. He was also listed as living with Talbot for a time. Later on, he was acknowledged as being one of the original Backstreet settlers in the Dunwich region, Backstreet being the nickname for Talbot Road. His family had been cited as building community facilities like schools and churches, and they operated businesses and served in political office. So it's pretty clear that the Philpots were here. Where was their land? Well, according to the Talbot regime memoirs, Talbot was told he could settle in Yarmouth or any region which was empty when he got there. Port Talbot, Colonel Talbot's primary base of operations, was built outside of Yarmouth in a region known as Dunwich. The 5,000 acres he claimed were in this region. If you're watching the video version of the talk uh, instead of the podcast, for simplicity's sake, I've marked the region on the Elgin map in green. Now, according to the land papers, Talbot acquired more land in 1804. So what, 5,000 acres wasn't enough? I've marked these in dark green. By 1806, we think he was facing increased pressures from his work crew to have land of their own. He set aside another 1,400 acres in his own name, and we think this is where he settled his indentured work crew. I've marked this in yellow. He set aside a 400-acre plot in Yarmouth in the name of a Joseph Smith. He was a merchant, and Yarmouth was said to be the most desirable area to have land in. Perhaps he was trying to set up a political connection that would help his settlement. Everything Talbot assigned in Dunwich was done doing the 50-150 scheme, putting it in his own name because he felt he owned the bulk of the land. Were the settlers aware of the scheme? We don't know. But from a high-level planning perspective, it made it very hard to understand which settlers were settled on which land. By 1809, we can see Talbot has acquired an additional 1,400 acres. Were these legitimate settlers or more indentured servants? They were still claimed in Talbot's name by the 50-150 scheme he had going. I have marked them on the map in orange. Now, there were land petitions sent to the government and settled in 1812, just before the war, on behalf of the Philpots and a family called the McIntyres. We believe they were granted part of the 1806 claim, believing they had 400 acres each. In 1811, John Philpot married Esther McIntyre. The ceremony was performed by Talbot himself. The Philpot descendants were later found in one of these Talbot regions. The McIntyres had donated land to Iona Cemetery from the Southwald side of the border just across from it. We don't think they were told exactly where Talbot was placing them, and they may have been a little geographically displaced. By 1812, the McIntyres were legitimately assigned the lot that they were inhabiting in Southwold. Half of it. The Philpots were assigned a plot just beside it. These were hidden in the Bayham Township papers under misspelled versions of their names. Uh, we're not sure if Talbot was being passive-aggressive, or if he was trying to purposely screw these families. Remember, both families thought they owned 400 acres when the grants to their names were only 200 acres. The Talbot regime book does state that Talbot did attempt to contact the official land allocation board to clear up the settlement in this region. He claimed because the war hit, they were unable to clear up the problem properly. Was he trying to keep these people on his own lands, trying to make them work and owe him rent instead of working their own land? It's unclear. The settlement was attacked by freighters, and there was a record that Philpot and McIntyre families were affected. They were both granted recompense from the government for property lost during the war. The Philpot children were listed as being born in Talbot's household, either because this was Talbot's rental land or because he literally lived in Talbot's house during the war. 
In 1812, we can see a John Philpot paying to purchase an additional 200 acres of land. In 1820, we can see Samuel McIntyre purchase the other half of his 400 acre lot as well. This legitimized the original claims of these families in their own minds. According to the government records, however, the lot inhabited by Philpot was not granted to him. They put a lot in Yarmouth this time for the second half of the land. His first half was in Southwold. Again, we don't think he was being told where the land allocation was. We think Talbot just said, no, no, don't worry, it's been handled. The Philpots continued to work their original 400 acres on Talbot land, and these other regions were left empty. The Talbot regions were never allocated to families officially, so it's pretty clear they knew the Philpots were there. We don't know if Talbot purposely misled them in passive aggression in order to continue to collect rent, or if they simply refused to move off the land since they had already put six years of work into building it. I can understand at this point why they think they own the land. Talbot appropriated it from the British government by saying he sold the land to settlers, but cash was tendered in his own name. This is cash that would have been owed for work completed building Talbot's home. Talbot extorted additional funds but didn't allow them to redeem it on the land they already claimed. 400 acres in Dunwich would have been allocated to the Philpots according to the Talbots 50-150 scheme, by which he would have only gained those lots for himself from the Canadian government by owing the Philpots 100 acres from the Talbots' land. They would not have been obligated to leave the Talbot grant because they owned those 100 acres their family cleared and built a house and farm on. Talbot did not have the right to displace them from lands that they had already paid for. In 1812, the government order and council ordered Talbot to hand over an additional 200 acres of land to their family, and instead of giving up the land within Talbot's grants, he tried to set aside a new lot and displace them. The acreage owed to them would have to be considered on top of the 100 acres they already owned. Now, if we look at the wages in Britain and the Americas in the 1800s, we can get a feel for what would have been owed to this family for labor, and whether or not their feelings may have been justified. According to the book of Early European Wages by Robert C. Allen, in the 1800s, a skilled carpenter could be earning anywhere between 150 to 160 pounds a year. Usually this was for working 10-hour days and 6 days a week. If we look at the nearby American wages in the Massachusetts report, they could have earned anywhere between 79 cents and $1.17 a day, depending on skill level. With 52 weeks in a year and 6 days in a week, this would have amounted to somewhere between $250 and $365. By today's exchange rate, this would have been in the equivalent of somewhere between 200 and 300 pounds a year. And this is just the husband's wages. I'm not considering the wife's wages for working as a maid in Talbot's household. I'm deducting her wages for room and board. Overall, this would have been about 450 to 900 pounds owed to the Philpot family for three years of hard labor. And this time, that was a lot of money. Now, according to the 5150 scheme, they must have agreed to accept wages for 100 acres. So Talbot could claim, in addition to what he already had, 300 acres. Otherwise, Talbot would not have been entitled to this region at all. He may have purposely misled the settlers into thinking they owned the whole 400-acre lot so that they would clear the land for him. We can see both the McIntyres and Philpots were later extorted to pay for an additional 200 acres, which these families paid thinking they were resolving their land claim once and for all. Talbot could not get the government to allocate the plots, whether intentionally or accidentally, and for whatever reason, their officially assigned plots were hidden in other regions of Elgin away from them, away from Dunwich. With a little bit of creative accounting by Talbot, he managed to take enough money from the Philpots to acquire an additional 600 acres for himself. This he did by applying the 5150 scheme he's been doing all along. Any other land grant outside of Dunwich in Southwold Bayham or Yarmouth appears to be done correctly in the paying settler's name. There's a lot less ambiguity there. Was he singling out the Dunwich settlers because it was his domain and he had to share the signing with other people elsewhere? Talbot was starting to appear a little corrupt, as if he was trying to be his own king in his own kingdom. But not everyone respected Talbot's authority 
several settlers just showed up and started assigning lots to themselves. In the 1820s, Talbot started setting aside certain plots as crown. Some of this land has been previously allocated to Talbot, and some of this land was never assigned, so he was returning it to the government because the government probably felt he didn't own it. I've marked this on the map in black. We think this was set aside for the building of churches and schools, or to appropriate back from the settlers he was moving from these regions to elsewhere in Upper Canada because they were dissatisfied with his rental scheme. All of these regions were later assigned to settlers by the 1870s, so you can see something political is going on there. In 1822, Talbot purchased one additional lot in his own name to prevent settlers from coming too close to his home. Was this some uh, underhanded um, way of indicating something sketchy was going on near that lot? I've added this to the dark green regions on the map. But come on, his home was 5,000 acres. How much space around it did he really need? Now in 1827, John Philpott died. He was survived by sons Abraham, 15, James, 12, John, 8, and William, 3, leaving behind his widow, Esther McIntyre Philpott. There were four daughters, Jane, 14, Lucinda, 12, Dorcas, 7, and Sally, 1. The Philpotts continued to occupy the lot in Dunwich. Uh, if we look at primogeniture laws surrounding inheritance at this time, in the absence of a will, the widow Esther would have been granted a third of the land for her to reside on until her death, to be held in trust for her eldest son. The eldest boy, Abraham, would have been the sole heir. We believe there may have been an ambiguous will. However, John was an illiterate laborer living in a region which had no law office. Many people at this time weren't creating wills. This is something that didn't take popularity until 20 years later. So we don't think he would have written a will. It doesn't really make sense. Esther was remarried in 1830 to a Francis Crane. The witnesses on Esther's remarriage were Elliot Young, Alfred Hamilton, and Rufus Lumley. The records for this marriage exist in the Anglican Church of St. Thomas of London, Upper Canada, which was founded in 1824. The marriage occurred three years after her husband's death. Perhaps she found new love or was simply pressured into the wedding and the manufacturing of a fake will to protect the Philpot lands for her children. Maybe the Crane, Young, Hamilton, and Lumley families thought they could gain access to the land by manipulating the widow. Either way, Francis and the Cranes would not have been privy to the beneficiary of the Philpot family. The handling of any will would have had to be executed before the wedding. At most, uh, her new husband would have been allowed to reside on her dowry land until she had to return it to her boys. Now we know that Canada abolished the idea of slavery and indentured servitude in 1834. The majority of families who had been granted land in the Elgin region for Talbot were Irish or Scottish craftsmen and farmers. By this new ruling, they could leave the lands they were indentured on or be expected to be granted payment for any work rendered. The Philpots continued to work on that 400-acre plot, still registered in Talbot's name at this point. But they did own 100 acres, so were they owed rages for the remaining land? Could the land be sold around them? It's very kind of unclear how this was supposed to be handled. Was Talbot still allowed to collect taxes from these people? From the Talbot regime book, we know he was collecting taxes, but we're not exactly sure how much. They generated a militia to serve in the area to protect from local unrest and American raiders from the West. After about one year of the abolishment of slavery, the eldest Philpott boy, Abraham, died in 1835 at the age of 23. It's not clear really what happened to him. But with no will, wife, or child, primogeniture law would have assigned the lands owned by the Philpots to the second son, James, who was now 21. At this point, there are 400 acres in Southwald and Yarmouth, unknowns to them, and 400 acres they are currently inhabiting still assigned to Talbot, of which 100 acres they should have owned. In 1836, an Amos Welding acquired land in Yarmouth. This was just down the road from the empty Philpot lot, if you look at today's map, this region is a swampland. It is currently named Yarmouth National Heritage Area. In the 1877 plot maps for the Yarmouth region, the welding lot remains unassigned to anyone. 
However, the Philpot land that had been left empty for 26 years in 1836 is now listed as being inhabited by an E.H. Welding. We believe the Welding family arrived in 1836, saw they got conned out of money for swamp lands, and decided to just appropriate the lands left empty further down the road. E.H. Welding had written a letter to the House of Industry and Refuge in 1867 offering to sell them this plot of land. It was not purchased, probably due to the fact that the Weldings didn't have a deed for the property. This is probably when the land was allocated to them in confusion because they were discovered inhabiting the land. This is the first 200 acres appropriated from the Philpot family to grant to the Weldings. The only official record I found for James's brother John was for a daughter, Lucy Jane Philpot. She was listed as a widower from Yarmouth being married to a John Abbott in 1894. In this record, John Philpot was mentioned as being married to a Catherine Hicks. Lucy Jane would have been born in 1849. John would have been about 29 at the time. Now there is a Hicks plot in Southwald and there was a Hicks Quaker community in Yarmouth. This implies John Philpot may have known about and have been living in Yarmouth on the Philpot lands, may be displaced by the Weldings. Otherwise, how did he get to Yarmouth? After the Upper Canada Rebellion, Talbot's regime started to lose steam. There was a lot of dissatisfied settlers complaining about political corruption. They wanted to elect their own leaders and manage themselves. This opened the door to settlers feeling justified to work around their overlords. In 1838, a lot in Southwald was purchased by James Best from Talbot. I mention this only because in 1846, Dorcas Philpot, James's sister, married James's Best's son, Elisha Best. Shortly after marrying, they wanted to settle on this plot. Elisha was also extorted from Talbot for additional payments before the father could appeal and transfer this already owned land to his son. In 1854, a John Lumley tried to claim his father had purchased 100 acres of this land in 1834, and it was just willed to him on his death, who tried to appeal in 1858 again. This plot remained entirely in the hands of the Best family, which we can see on the maps of 1877. This is not the first time we've seen a Lumley hanging around the Philpot family relatives to try and steal land. In the 1850s, the plot of signing gets a bit erratic. Several lots appear to be contested in sales. I'm not sure who's handling the signing of lots at this point. Talbot died in 1852 in his 80s, so clearly he wasn't doing the land allocation himself. Around 1859, Talbot's land papers were gathered by the government so they could take up control over the signing themselves. The region started to elect government officials. After the politicians took over, people started having to get more creative to work around them. That's when we started seeing murder. Now around this time, the Philpots owned a general store in a city called Iona. The firstborn son of James Philpot was John Alexander. He served as a postmaster at the Iona station between 1868 and 1872. John Alexander was also documented as being paid a lump sum of money from the government treasury for the building of the school in the region. Between 1869 and 1871, John Alexander was serving as Reeve in Dunwich. Think of this as an elected county mayor. His postmaster role might have been part of the reason he was elected, because many folks may have interacted with their postmaster. In 1870, shortly after John A. was elected, one Samuel Price of St. Thomas started to gather creditors against John A. They were trying to imply he was insolvent, meaning bankrupt and owed a lot of money. In a background check of Samuel Price, I can see this man had claimed 13 insolvencies between 1867 and 1874. He had one woman declared insane, he indentured one of the people he bankrupted, and witnessed the will of Malcolm McIntyre while Malcolm was still living. Um, observing these records from a high level, he looked like an organized criminal and con artist, so clearly someone had it out for John Alexander. Price was unsuccessful in officially declaring John A. insolvent, but John's reputation absolutely did suffer. They held another election for Reeve, where he was barely elected in again, but he did continue to hold the seat. In 1871, he was removed from his position as Reeve, as well as the Dunwich Agricultural Society treasurer, where he was demoted to secretary. 
They did try to claim he was trying to bribe folks with membership in order to keep himself elected. Was this true, or another attack on his reputation? In 1872, the Canadian Southern Railway built a station just north of them in Iona, bringing prosperity to the region. This attracted a variety of hotels and business owners. We believe John A. may have been an investor or shareholder. Also in 1872, we can see he was paid a huge lump of money for laying the swampification pipes to free up wetlands for agricultural development. This is a technology that had been seen to be widespreadly successful across New York and the United States. In 1873, John A. moved to Courtright to work at the Montreal Telegraph Company office that had just opened up there. A new railroad as part of the Canadian Southern Railway would be opening in 1874, just off the border of the United States. John A. was said to be the station master. Unfortunately, his newborn baby, Anna Mae Philpott, suspiciously died on November 12, 1873. John A. suspiciously died shortly after, on January 12, 1874. His widow, Georgina Elliot McGregor Philpott, and his surviving four children, daughter Catherine Lavina, 13, son James McGregor, 12, son Peter Wiley, 8, and son Mullen Shirley, 5, were told that he had died destitute. They were cast out of the family home with no money to try and survive on their own, so they left Elkin behind. Now, John A. was a man who was a leader in business industry and a politician. He was a partner with the railroad, and we know he just received a huge sum of money for his work on the agricultural deswampification. There is no way this guy was bankrupt. So what happened? According to the Peter Wiley book, the eight-year-old son was told by his uncle that his father was a drunken solvent, and that's why they were being cast out of the family home. There were some other rumors about how he died, but all of them involved John A.'s body being lost to the St. Clair River and having never been buried. You have to remember, by primogeniture law, John A. would have inherited all of the Philpot land, so was this a coup by his in-laws to appropriate it from him? Oh my god, well, what happened to his estate then? Well, his household was taken by his younger brother, William. We assume, therefore, John Alexander and his family were living on the land still owned by James Philpot, his father. He may have owned additional land in Corrib, or he may have been staying with relatives at the time. We're not quite sure. That was not included as part of my Elgin study. Perhaps it would make a good uh, secondary podcast in the future. In terms of his work life, John A. was replaced by Thomas McCall as the Dunwich Reeve. He was replaced at the Courtright Station by William Sparling. Sparling and the president of Canadian Southern Railway, Milton Courtright, resigned shortly after John Alexander's death in February, not one month later, so we can see something hinky was going on. John Alexander's other brother, John Philpot, was a member of a Masonic temple called the Prince of Wales, created in 1865, formed by an existing Masonic group, Member Lodge 120 in Fingal. Their members were John Cascaden, Daniel DeCal, John Edgecombe, William Chisholm, Isaac Stolicker, Ephraim Lumley, R. McCullough, C. A. Brown, James Lumley, and James Mitchell. The master of the new site was declared to be John Cascaden, and they recruited the members John Edgecombe, William Chisholm, J.C. Finley, James McLandress, Ephraim Lumley, John Philpot, William Simpkins, and Isaac Stolicker. Now, the members of this group will become important shortly because these people started appearing as owning land on Philpot and McIntyre plots. I found a few different map records trying to understand who owned the land. In one handwritten version of the 1877 map containing parts of Dunwich and Southwold, I've marked the politicians in red, the Lumley family relatives in yellow, the Masonic Brotherhood in orange, and the original backstreet settlers in light gray purple. The original Philpot grants I've marked in green, and the original McIntyre plot I've marked in blue. If we look at the Dunwich holdings, we can see only a 110-acre of the 400-acre portion they originally thought they owned still allocated to the Philpot family. We can see the names I. Stolicker, notice it's one of the Masonic brothers, as well as a Mrs. Casey and a Clark. 
Today on these lands there exists a care farm. If we look at those acres in Southwold that were formerly McIntyre and Philpot owned, we can see that much of the land was now assigned elsewhere. For the McIntyre land on Lot 1, Masonic leader Dr. Cascadden now owned a large portion of the South End, with the Iona Cemetery donated by the McIntyre family still on the back of his lot. The Black family now on the north end, sandwiching the McIntyres between them. Lot 2 is now owned by the Lodges and the Cares. In 1848, after the death of Samuel McIntyre, who owned Lot 1, it appears as if the Philpots and the McIntyres were working together on this land. The Care, Lodges, and McCall family did not have as large a territory in their names at this point. Since Samuel McIntyre was related by blood to the Philpots, it makes sense that he would cede his lot to the remaining sons and grandsons of his family that did not already have land. This would include William Philpot, James Philpot's brother, Samuel's grandson. It would also include Jacob McIntyre, Daniel's son. We think grandson Abraham wasn't granted any land because he was going to inherit his father Daniel's land. Now, the Cares claim to be related to the McIntyres by marriage, so this leads us into the next section talking about marriage appropriation. Sarah Ann McIntyre married Colin Lumley in 1832. Sometime after, Colin Care married Mary Ann Lumley. Now, there's something suspicious about this claim. Our Sarah Ann that would have been related to Daniel would have been 14 at the time of this marriage. No relative or family member signed the marriage bond, so clearly this is either an unrelated McIntyre, or they made it all up. She had no children with Colin, and later died at the age of 26 in 1844. Did she refuse to marry him? Did they kill her for it? So clearly the Cares are not related to the McIntyres through this Lumley. Janet Care married William Lodge. This was Colin's sister. Okay, so what about the Lodges then? Well, we can see there are three marriages that occurred in London. Mary McIntyre married Joseph Lodge in 1836. This was supposedly witnessed by Daniel and her older sister's husband, Colin Lumley. Let's stop and remember for a sec that that marriage bond didn't make sense. Later in 1840, Catherine married Joseph's brother James, which was also supposedly witnessed by her father and her brother-in-law. Now, Daniel's wife Elizabeth had died the year before, so they also remarried Daniel to a married Lumley. In the 1842 census, we can see the lodges were living with Colin Lumley on John Clark's land. This was just south of the Philpots. By 1848, the Lodges had moved to Southwold. Mary and Joseph had moved to the McIntyre lot, and Catherine and James had moved to the south of them on the Axford lot. Was this sold to them, or did they appropriate it? As Daniel was still living when Samuel McIntyre died, I doubt his children would have been included on in the will. They would have been reliant on Daniel to grant them this land. Now, the William Lodge that Jeanette Kerr married is supposed to be the son of Mary and Joseph Lodge. The Black family at the North End was connected through the Lumleys as well, which is starting to look suspicious, by marriage to the Guernseys. Alex Guernsey married Maria Lumley in 1860. Charles Guernsey married Catherine Black in 1866. John Cascaden was married to a Hannah de Cow. Hannah was the daughter of Daniel DeCow, who had also married a Lumley. Hannah, however, was not the daughter of the Lumley. She was the daughter of the second wife, Lucy Ann McGregor. It appears as if the Lumleys were using their marriages with the McIntyres to gain control of their land and started parceling it off for their own political usage, rather than McIntyre's benefit. For Philpot Lot 3, we can see the Kerr family, on behalf of Colin Kerr, took over most of the lot. This was the man who was married to a Lumley. Colin Kerr purchased Lot 14 of the Gore, and it's supposed to be northeast, in 1835. It was resold in 1840, so it's clear he didn't like the lot, he just appropriated something else, and they just resold it. The rest of the lot was allocated to Dugal McCall, the son of Nicole McCall, who now inhabited Lot 4. In an excerpt of the 1819 Township Papers, this was owned by Brian Holmes. 
In that 1848 Southwald assessment, this lot was owned by Dugald MacArthur. Now, Nepal was supposed to be on Lot 9, Concession 5, or that gore space between the 4th Concession and northbound Talbot Road, basically northeast of where he is now. It was a school site purchased in 1842. Perhaps he didn't like his lot and just grabbed something else that was empty. Nicole was married to Mary McIntyre, daughter of Daniel, but that didn't give him the right to appropriate land next to their lots. Now, this leads us into the section about mistaken identities, or fake persons. In the Tweedsmer Women's Institute document, there was a blurb written about school section 5, which was in this area. This is supposedly the school which John Alexander Philpott built. The document talked about the history of the local area, and mentions that the lot was sold to call and care by a John Philpott, either Grandfather John Philpott Sr. or Father John Philpott Jr., as they explicitly cited that the man was a Nova Scotian. Now, when I looked up Colin Kerr, he died in 1914 at the age of 63. John Philpott Sr. would have been 154 when he died and 91 when he was born. It's very unlikely that John Philpott Sr. would have been alive to sell this land to him. John Philpott Jr. died in 1827, 24 years before Colin was even born. John Alexander was not a Nova Scotian. He was born in Elgin, so it couldn't have been him. And Uncle John, again, was not a Nova Scotian. He was born in Elgin, so it couldn't have been him either. The same document claims this fake John Philpot also sold a lot to the, self, to the Silcoxes. Uh, these are another family that were related to the Lumleys, and were the actual contributors of the information of this Tweedsmere document. In 1819, this was supposed to be owned by a United Empire Loyalist. However, by 1848, it had changed hands to a Ira Gilbert and Archibald Brown. Like I said, the Women's History document was written by a ladies' organization based off information gossiped about town. All the related photos in this document were donated by the Silcox, who were the Lumley relatives related to the Cares, who also benefited from this fake Philpot sale of the land. So clearly they were trying to control the narrative. At the time this document was written in 1925, the Philpots were all dead, including the fake guy, and any other Philpot survivors were removed from the area. So basically nobody was around to be consulted to validate the truth of that. When I dug deeper, in the 1877 Elgin County map, a John Philpot was listed as owning 25 acres of land further up North Talbot Road in Southwold, near a city called Payne's Mills. I found a marriage record for a John Philpot from England, not related to our Irish Philpots in Elgin. He was born eight years before landowner James's younger brother, Uncle John. He was listed as marrying an Almira Hamilton at the age of 60 when Almira was 44 in 1872. The marriage was witnessed by the Carlisles, who were found literally right beside this 25-acre plot. They likely sold it to him. Another Hamilton plot was not that far away. At the time of this marriage and British John's entrance to Elgin, Colin Kerr would have been 21, which would have been an ideal time to purchase this land and start a family. Now, when I looked up Elmira, I found her in 1861 in Markham, York. That this, she was living with her brother Hiram, who was 34 when she was 26, and kids Jane 9, John 7. And it explicitly listed she was a spinster. Not a widow, a spinster. In the 1871 census, Elmira had moved to Southwold. But now she's claiming to be 43, and she's still living with kids John, who's now 17. But now Jane is listed as being 11, and there's a new child, Frances, who is 9. It looks like someone brought this desperate woman to Southwold in order to use her name as a Hamilton. There was a Mrs. Hamilton listed right beside this British John's lot. Perhaps this was her land? Okay, but then how would a never married woman with children find money to buy land? In the Tweedsmere Women's History, 
there is a record of a Ruth Lumley Hamilton. There also appears to be a marriage record saying they got married in 1826. When I went to check the census records to validate this, in 1851 I can see Senior Henry, 79, and his wife Mary, 73, were living with Henry Hamilton, 52, and wife Rhoda, 50 as well as their adult children, Jeremiah, 25, Thomas, 23, and Hannah, 21. So, no Ruth. Okay, there were also three Rhoda Hamiltons in Southwald. Besides the one living with Henry, there was a Rhoda Mary Ann, 54, and Rhoda Eliza, 42. These two Rhodas were suspiciously living together. Now, in 1855, Rhoda Mary married a Drake, so she's not around anymore. By 1861, only Rhoda E. was left, by herself, living on a lot. Perhaps this is the Rhoda meant to replace Henry Hamilton's wife. I say this because Ancestry.ca seems to think she died in 1881, but she's clearly not around anymore. I was not able to find any grave or burial for her. In 1871, there's only a Rhoda. The E is conspicuously dropped, but it appears to be the same age as former Rhoda E. And she's still living alone. So, who was Rhoda E? And why did they seem to think the woman's name was Ruth? Well, I found a burial record for a Ruth Hamilton Clark. This woman has about the same birth date as the woman in the Tweedsmere documents, but she was not a Lumley. She was a legitimate Hamilton who had married John Clark. She was the mother of a Mary Ann who married a Lumley, a John Lumley. Now, Mary Ann Clark Lumley was born in 1823. She died in 1901 under her original name. This woman is about the same age as Rhoda Eliza. Are they the same person? No, Marianne had a brother, Elijah, and a sister, Ruth Eliza. Coincidence? Now, fake John Philpot married Elmira in 1872. Rhoda disappeared from the census after 1871. Hmm... I don't know. It could be a coincidence, but it was the best theory I had in lieu of any real records for Ruth. Now, I don't know about you, but to me it's pretty obvious what happened here. I don't believe this 25-acre plot was owned by the Philpot family in Elgin. I think it's very likely this man was brought to the town to appropriate land for the Cares and the Silcoxes. I think Lumley's friends set fake John up with a 25-acre plot and a nice marriage to a woman 20 years his junior to do it. And oh yeah, remember we thought Uncle John Philpot was a member of the Masonic Brotherhood? Now I think it's clear we can probably absolve him. The Masonic Brotherhood member may have been imposter British dude, not our Elgin Philpot relative, because we know imposter British dude was actually part of the Lumley Circle. When he died in 1890, his inheritor and executor of his will was a Lucy Jane Down, wife of Ralph Down. You might remember earlier I mentioned Lucy Jane Philpot as being a child of legal John Philpot of Yarmouth, who married an abbot. On the 1871 census, British John Philpot was living with a Catherine and a Lucy Jane. So clearly the Lucy Jane from before is actually British John's kid, not our Elgin John's kid. Was there even a brother John? There's no record of him. As we're looking at people who don't really exist, or who are pretending to be someone else, there's one more person that we should consider. Remember that John A. got removed from Reeve office in August of 1870, when they declared him insolvent? His replacement was a Thomas McCall. Apparently Dunwich elected the famous Elder Thomas McCall, a minister of the Baptist Church in Alderboro. The man was ordained in 1852. He served until he became too feeble, and then he came to Dunwich. 
1861 census with John A. Philpott and wife Georgina had Elder Thomas McCall on it as well, so we know they're living in Dunwich during the election. Elder McCall, however, died on October 17, 1870, at the age of 79, not two months after being elected. One thing to note is he's an Alderboro McCall, so he's supposedly not related to Nicole McCall, unless they've got some common roots from Scotland we don't know about. By December 1870, they called a new election where a younger Thomas McCall was now running for office. So this guy just shows up in Dunwich, about the same age as Elder McCall's nephew from Alderboro, with the same name, and suddenly he gets elected Reeve. Okay, yeah, that's not suspicious at all. Did folks think they were still voting for the Elder Thomas? Did they realize he was dead? Did they think this guy was related? Was he related? How can we be sure? According to the 1851 census, nephew Thomas was 22 and living with his mother Mary, along with most of his unwed family in Alderboro. But for whatever reason, he disappeared in 1861. He wasn't on any census. Perhaps he went to the United States. Okay, so how did he know to come back to Canada? In the 1871 census, after he was elected Reeve, he appeared to be 41 and living with wife Anne, 25, and son Samuel, 4. His age matched the nephew. But how do we know? It's not like his uncle's around to validate his existence. Hmm. Well, maybe it didn't matter if he was that guy or not. Thomas McCall the Jr. managed to get himself re-elected, so maybe the people liked him. He served as Reeve between 1870 and 1872. John Galbraith managed to reseat himself in 1873. This brings us into our next section, talking about political appropriation. British John showed up on the 1871 census, at the time when John Alexander Philpott was serving as Reeve of Dunwich and facing a lot of smear campaigns. I think the goal was to use this obviously fake sale of land, including a region that was not owned by the Philpots, to discredit John Alexander. John Alexander had won the election for Reeve of Dunwich by taking it away from John Galbraith in 1869. Galbraith was married to a Sarah Black in 1864, and we already saw the Black's ties to the Lumleys. Now, John Galbraith didn't take any land directly from the Philpots. This would have been too suspicious, but there were several other politicians who did. Nicole McCall, who we found on Lot 4, was a provincial government representative for the Elgin West region from 1867 to 1871. Did McCall use this political power to pen his name into the lot? Did he help the Silcoxes and Care appropriate the rest of the land as collaborators? Did he use the new Dunwich Reeve, the Thomas McCall, who's supposedly unrelated, but had the same family name, to help him? Either way, it's clear he and his family benefited. His son Dugald was also a government representative for Elgin West from 1890 to 1894. Let's stop and talk about the Casey's for a second. This family was also seen as having land on the Philpot Grant, more specifically in Dunwich. Mrs. Casey was the mother of George Elliot Casey, born in 1850. Casey was a politician in the House of Commons from 1872 to 1900. The Liberal government appointed him as parliamentary librarian in 1903, where he died shortly after at the age of 53 of a heart attack. Perhaps this is where he was granted access to the land records and started writing his own version of history, and someone offed him to hide the evidence. Who knows? From what we can see in the records, George Eliot Casey's family also had a history of strange land appropriation in the Southwold region. Between his grandfather, George Eliot, his father, William Casey, who some history books call George, not William, and his mother, the Mrs. Casey, they acquired quite a collection of land. Remember, fake British John Philpott was awarded for land appropriation in 1872. 
George Eliot Casey started in the House of Commons in 1872. In Dunwich, we can see a good portion of Philpot land was appropriated by Mrs. Casey. She donated two pieces of land to the Lumley family, one to build a church in 1874, shortly after John A.'s death. Now, this church looks a lot like School Section 5, the school that John A. had previously built. She had donated land again in 1888 to build the J.O. Lumley store shortly after the Philpotts family home burned down in 1888. Yeah, it looks like Casey was working with the Lumleys. Just to the south, Mrs. Casey has appropriated lands that was previously allocated to Talbot. Did her son use his political appointment to try and steal lands that were already being squatted on? Did he put it in his mother's name to try and hide his connection? Overall, we can see that plots that were previously assigned to Talbot, Philpotts, or McIntyre seem to strangely now have the names McCall and Casey on them. Both were politicians, both had political access. In 1877, another politician's name started appearing in places it shouldn't. Mullen Burwell ended up with a lot directly beside the poor Talbot's original 5,000 grant that he previously been unassigned. Now Mullen was a surveyor for the region. He didn't have any official allocations in Dunwich during Talbot's reign. According to his own biography, he was owed 4.5% of the land he surveyed. So what, he just penned himself into Talbot's existing land grant? Mullen built Port Burwell in Bayham Township, and that was his primary base of operations, so presumably that's where he was requesting his land. These are the township papers where the Philpot grants in Southwald, as well as other grants to early settlers, were hiding. Does this mean Mullen had a hand in the appropriation? He definitely had access to the papers. The Talbot regime book implies Burwell was helping to sell lots for Talbot, the Burwell biography implies he was sponsored by Talbot to gain government office in 1812 as a member of the House of Assembly for the province. However, by 1818, he started trying to usurp control from Talbot and question his land allocations. There's a document in the township papers allocating a lot that does not exist in Elgin that Burwell himself certified to a wealthy merchant, therefore someone important in 1818. This is about the same time he was discrediting Talbot, so it looks like he was trying to manufacture his own evidence by convincing Talbot to sell plots that didn't exist. Perhaps the Burwells thought they could get rid of Talbot to gain control of the process. Suspicious though, right? As I was looking through the town papers again, one association linked most of our land appropriating suspects together. When John Kilbraith was serving as Deputy Reeve, John Clark, Nicole McCall, Daniel DeCow, and James Philpot were all serving as Justices of the Peace. This would have been in either 1861 or 1865. Now there's another name that's been popping up a lot, John Clark. He lived from 1800 to 1881. He legitimately purchased a lot on the back street, aka North Talbot Road, but all the way up near Payne's Mills. This is near where our fake John Philpot resided. He was married to a Hamilton in 1822. Yes, the Ruth Hamilton we discussed before, who had a daughter and who married a Lumley. This is the woman we thought may have helped legitimize the fake Hamilton spinster as a good wife candidate for fake British John Philpot. Now, the real Ruth Hamilton was already dead, but her husband was still alive. One of their daughters married a Silcox. Hannah Clark married George Silcox in 1857. Yes, George is one of the people who claim to have purchased that south side lot for fake John sold. So, did John Clark, Justice of the Peace, use political power to help the sale go through? As I was looking into this trail of thought, I found a care connection too. Archibald Kerr was the deputy reeve of Southwald 
1873. This was when Fake John got rewarded with his marriage. If we go further back, he was also Deputy Reeve in 1864 and 1861. He was Reeve in 1867. So he definitely had a large enough window of time in office to do something with that power. Now, the other Justice of the Peace, Daniel DeKau, whose son was a Lumley, also had some time in office. In 1861, he was the Reeve of Dunwich. He was also the Deputy Reeve of Dunwich in 1863 and 1864. He returned to being Reeve in 1865. This was about the time where he helped bring the Masonic Brotherhood to Iona. And we definitely saw those guys popping up everywhere. Okay, we know there was a period of time between Burwell's death in 1846 and the reclaiming of the township papers by the government in 1859 where things were starting to go wonky. Lots were being assigned strangely, there were land disputes. Perhaps it was not the officials, and maybe instead it was people knowing what to do and say to con those officials. This takes us into our next section with fake buyers and sellers of the land, con artists. At this point in my investigation, I was starting to believe the Lumleys were the prime family and they were the ones pressuring and leveraging the politicians and families in the community to gain more and more land and political power for themselves and their relatives. I was thinking perhaps they were the con artists. In the official township papers about the Lumleys, I can see the following entries. One lot appears to have been purchased from a James Roach. The two halves of the lot were acquired on two separate dates. In 1849, Thomas Lumley was witnessed to purchase the north half by his own son. In 1853, Rufus, the son, purchased the south half of the lot. The first land claim was three years after Master Burwell's death. The second half was purchased about six years before the government reclaimed the township papers. Now, this isn't the first time a roach appears associated with crazy land claims. William Roach's name appeared all over the Dunwich Town papers for contested claims on land that had no improvements built on them, meaning no one had tried to build houses or clear the land. Land appropriator John Roach also attempted to use John Philpot Sr., meaning James's grandfather, military records to acquire a plot of land in 1844. This was while Burwell was still alive, but he was 61, so maybe he had help with those papers. Irish John Philpot Sr. did serve in the army in Nova Scotia, however, he would have been in his 80s. Also, there are two death claims, one that he died in Southwald and one that he died in Nova Scotia. I'm starting to believe the guy that died in Southwall was actually our British impersonator and that this land was appropriated in the Philpot name. It looks like they asked for 200 acres but were assigned 400 acres. One of the 200 acre plots was suspiciously beside William Roach's own claim. The other one appears to be inhabited by a Clark. Remember, this is a Lumley relative. Regardless of who appropriated it, it means another 400 acres belonged to the Irish Philpot family, as it was granted to them, freely, for their family's military service. It was not assigned to the appropriators. Again, under Ontario primogeniture law, without a will, it would have been inherited by James Philpot, our Philpot family head. In 1853, there is a mention that James Philpot purchased a plot of land from a James Bodeman near the grandfather's lot. Perhaps this was for his little brother, William. As a half lot, this would have been another 50 acres owned by the Philpot family. By 1877, the Elgin map showed a W. Smith on this lot. Wasn't that the merchant family that Talbot was helping? Hmm, okay. Today, this land sits north of the 401 in a heavily forested region, possibly wetlands. There appears to be a little farm on it and a house, so the land is still intact, but we don't know who actually owns it. Now, if we go back to the Lumleys, there was another half of a lot that was acquired by a widow, Frances Lumley. She had claimed that Ephraim Lumley sold her the farm in 1868. The widow's lot was nearby a Crown Land Reserve, 
that held a former Iroquois palisade sitting in Mullen Burwell's holding in Southwold, which was never officially assigned to him in the township papers either. It was in a region with a lot of rivers and wetlands that Talbot purposely did not acquire for his own settlement. It was considered lower quality land that buying settlers were passing over. Perhaps it would be an ideal place for a squatter to set up their own housing and settlement without paying for land. In 1854, we remember also that the Lumleys tried to appropriate the best farm and failed. It's really obvious at this point the Lumleys weren't legitimately wealthy. They weren't paying for plots. They didn't have money from working the land, and they weren't recognized by Talbot in any official land allocation. The official land allocations for them only started appearing after Mullen Burwell had died in that window of chaos before the papers were reclaimed. Um, it seems like someone had knowledge of where these lots were and were specifically targeting them. Who knows, maybe they were just finding empty land they could squat on. Well, either way, the Lumley name started appearing in official historical documents after the premature death of John Philpott in 1827. We think this is when they started building houses on other folks' lands. Now one theory is the Lumleys may have come to Elgin as indentured servants of the Burwells. According to the Upper Canada Census of 1842, there were five Lumley households headed by the five Lumley brothers. Remember at this time in history the census would have been filled out by a traveling record keeper. He would have walked from household to household filling it out on their behalf after talking to the families present. Now Thomas Lumley, the eldest Lumley member, claimed to own 60 acres and have seven family members. He was listed as living with the real owner of the land, Mullen Burwell. Thomas was listed on the census as being a farmer, but he was also mentioned in the Sims history books as being a cooper, which is a barrel maker, and carrying black ash around as a laborer. We think they were living on the Mullen Burwell plot in Dunwich. Joseph Lumley, Thomas's brother, claims to be a head of household which he owns. He claims to have nine members in his household and own 25 acres of land. He was listed as being a farmer. In the Sims history book, the family is claiming that Joseph owned that farm plot the widow Frances managed to acquire in 1868. Okay, so it jumped from 25 acres to 100 acres. Interesting. Colin Lumley, Thomas's brother, claims to be the head of household living on the lands of John Clark. He claims to have 13 family members living with him and own 100 acres. The Sims history book claims Colin and Rufus settled to the west of Joseph. There is a J. Clark lot here on the 1877 map that was formerly allocated to Talbot. John Lumley, Thomas's brother, claims to be the head of household of one, living on 35 acres. If we compare this to the Sims history book, it, he claims to have settled somewhere on Lake Road, which by 1877 was allocated to John Clark. Talbot had claimed these lots for himself to buffer from noisy neighbors. I wonder if you meant the Lumleys. Last brother William Lumley also claimed to be a real landowner. He claims he had 75 acres and nine people living in his household. If we compare this to the Sims history book, it was described as west of Joseph, north of the back street. This was a lot officially assigned to Talbot, but thought to be owned by the Philpots. If we look at the 1887 map, we can see Clark's name present here on the Philpot grant. Perhaps the Lumleys weren't aware of Talbot's arrangement with the Philpots, or perhaps they were just targeting any strip of unbuilt on land and the Philpots hadn't gotten to this piece yet. We can see that the, this Clark plot was on the opposite end of the lot from where the Philpots were building out. So there were 39 Lumley family members sitting on Burwell and Clark land that had been appropriated from Colonel Talbot. After the death of Burwell in 1846, by 1877 we can see they had spread out and just assumed uncleared land throughout Talbot, Philpot, McIntyre, and Burwell lots. This started the rise of the Lumley family in Elgin County, all without paying for land, acquired through land appropriation and marriage appropriation. Now I can see they've married into a few families. This includes the DeKalb's, the Cares, 
the Mills, the Silcoxes, the Hamiltons, there's links to Gabraiths, there's probably more. If you look at the Sims history book, it's kind of funny. All of these Lumley relatives are mentioned first at the top of the section describing Iona Station. Were they trying to tell us something? Were they trying to point out the Lumley relatives? Hmm. Were the Lumley relatives controlling the narrative in this region? Who knows? There were several cases in the Dunwich Township papers where either a Clare or a Clark acquired land, then the region became heavily disputed with claims that had been sold to multiple people. I've marked the appropriate Lumley relatives land in red on the Elgin map for an idea of where they were trying to locate. If we look at some of the land Talbot returned to the Crown by 1877, these allocations are now held by some familiar names. The Graham family, the McCall family, the Campbells, the Caseys. In one region, the neighboring McIntyre appears to have been moved by a Clark and pushed into Crown lands. From this investigation, I'm thinking what might have happened was Burwell may have been trying to appropriate the land assigning from Talbot. He probably wanted to take control. He may have purposely misled Talbot into misassigning plots in 1818 in order to discredit him to take over. When Burwell died in 1846, the Lumley servants, already living inside his household, started appropriating lands. Were they freed indentured servants of his? Or were they just using his name to hide out in, in Talbot's unused lands? It looks like they were targeting land that was not yet built upon, but had somehow managed le to legally put this in either a Clark, Kerr, or Silcox name, around the time the politicians McCall's and Casey's were doing it for their own families. Perhaps these politicians collaborated with them. We can also see a lot of folks related to the Lumley family using the Kerr or Clark family name benefiting off of stolen land. They were listed on the 1842 census as living in the Burwell household, and he was also a politician who had direct access to the land papers. In Yarmouth, the Weldings appeared to have appropriated the empty lot there, because they didn't like what they had purchased. John Galbraith took over John Alexander's post as Reeve after his death. The Galbraith family had marriage ties to the Campbells, the DeCows, who had lonely ties. The Campbells also had their own name showing up on Crown, Empty Lot, and Dunwich. Even the Masonic Brotherhood in Elgin, which had a large Lumley representation, as well as the fake British John Philpot Pawn, appears to have reaped the benefits of land appropriation in Dunwich. The story of what happened to School Section 5 is the best explanation for how Stoliker and Clark ended up on Philpot lands in Dunwich. John A. was paid for the building of this school on his lands. After his death, a building that looks surprisingly like it appeared on Mrs. Casey's land. When I did a little bit of digging into this school, I found a Tremaine's map of 1865. On it, Tremaine claimed the school was sitting on Lot A, southeast corner of Concession 7. If we look at the 1877 map of Dunwich, there is no school listed here, but it is listed on Lot B of Concession 8, where Clark is living. Now, in Tremaine's map version of 1865, the Graham family owned Lot A of Concession 7. Did the Graham family convince the mapper to redraw the lines so that they could sell Stoliker and Clark Lot B of Concession 8? Did the Lumleys move school section 5 and use the materials to build their Methodist church donated by Mrs. Casey on lot C of concession 8 to get it away from their Clark relatives land? This deal clearly benefited the Grahams, Clarks, and the Caseys. In the Sims history book, Stoliker was listed as being a blacksmith. Perhaps he was originally just a lodger on Philpot lands and tried to claim it was his land. The Briton, who might have been fake John Philpot, was living on land that was, according to Tremaine's version of the story, owned by a Tate. Tate was a shoemaker, another businessman. Very likely he was only a lodger. Again, another lodger claiming they own the land. Over 50 years, 850 acres were allocated directly to the Philpot family. 250 acres was for direct payment, 
400 acres was for John Philpot Sr.'s military service, and 200 acres was assigned to them by the Order of Council by the Government of Canada. 100 acres would have been allocated according to Talbot's 5150 scheme, by which he would have only gained those lots for himself by owing the Philpots 100 acres from Talbot lands. This means the Philpots owned at least 950 acres of lands across Eldon County that we are aware of. By 1877, only 110 acres remained in their name. It appears as if they took no benefit or made any money from working Talbot's part of the land grant and the region around them, which they thought they owned. This was instead appropriated by a Lumley relative on behalf of the Clarks, the politician Casey and the Masonic Brotherhood Stolicker. It looks like James Philpot may have been aware of his grandfather's 400 acres that were signed for military service in Dunwich. We know this because he tried to purchase land right beside it. Presumably this was for his little brother William. Maybe they were trying to extend Philpot lands in a region they thought they already owned, decided to only purchase 50 acres in case surrounding land got stolen again. It looks like the Philpot never knew about the land in Yarmouth that was stolen by the Weldings. The South Wahal land also remained hidden and unclaimed, and it was later appropriated by the political family McCalls and the Lumley relatives the Cares using the fake John Philpot. Son John Alexander was a politically important figure as a reeve of Dunwich, and he had built schools, laid agricultural drainage pipes, and helped to bring the railroad to Upper Canada. They came at him claiming he was insolvent, but there were public records that he was very wealthy, so we know this wasn't the case. Who knows if there were other lands purchased by him outside of Elgin, for example in Courtright, where he was working, that I didn't look into as part of my research. All we know is for his service to Elgin, and because of the political power and wealth he acquired for his family, he was likely murdered in order to appropriate this from him. John Alexander's children and wife were run off the land and told to find their own way with nothing. Perhaps his siblings participated, due to their jealousy and connections with the Lumley family. The Lumleys had been circling their family since 1830. Rufus Lumley was witness to the marriage of widow Esther McIntyre Philpot to Francis Crane. You may recall this is James's mother. What about Daniel Philpot? This was the brother that everyone thought had died in 1870. He was in fact living in 1871, north of them, near Iona Station. On the 1871 census, he was living with his wife, Sarah Ann Shackleton, and daughter Maggie, who was three. We think it was up on that plot that had been purchased by James in 1853. Daniel was living in close proximity to Emily Philpot, who was William's daughter. She was living with her maternal grandparents, Alexander and Mary Milligan. Now her cousins were Lumleys. Her aunt, Frances, married Colin Lumley, who also married a Sarah Ann McIntyre. One strange thing I noticed about their family was Alexander Milligan's will was read in 1865, even though, as per the census records of 1871, he was still living with his wife Mary and his granddaughter Emily at the time. Now she got out of there eventually and married a Thomas Griffin just down the road, just south of the plot where Daniel was living on. By 1881, though, Daniel was gone. There's no sign of him anywhere. Now he was last seen on the census for 1871. Did he disappear before his brother died in 1874, or was he murdered first? Now his wife was suspicious. This Shackleton woman was not found on any census before marrying him. His uncle, however, married a Sarah Jacobs, and she had two existing children living with her, an Elizabeth Shackleton and a Sylvester Jacobs. Uncle William and cousin Abram disappeared after the census of 1861 leaving only a Shackleton behind. Is she the same Shackleton who attached herself to Daniel? Were they a family of black widows? Were they trying to get this land from the Philpots? We'll never know. Now Esther Philpot, John A's sister, was married to John Mills, whose uncle was married to a Lumley. Sarah Philpot, his other sister, was married to Duncan McGregor Macau, whose elder half-brother's mother was a Lumley. In 1871, she was living with her husband in Strathoy. 
After her father-in-law, Daniel DeKal, was declared insolvent in 1876, they disappeared. An article in the Talbot Times claims in 1893 that Sarah had gone to Colorado, but I was never able to find any record of her here. She just disappeared. His younger brother, William, directly appropriated John Alexander's household. Esther and William were both listed as living in Iona up until James Philpott's death, at which point they left to Colorado, presumably to search out Sarah, maybe so they could handle the final will. A good portion of their family is buried here in Cripple Creek. It appears as if William might have gotten caught up in the labor riots going on in Colorado at the time between the miners. There were several accidents, and he appeared to die around the same time. If he had money from selling Philpot land, why would he be working as a miner at the time? It gets weirder. Paul and Lumley's eldest two children were found living around Colorado at the time of these labor strikes. Gideon Lumley, son of Francis Milligan and Colin Lumley, died away from his family at the age of 67 in 1914 in Pueblo, which is southeast of Cripple Creek. His family was in Iowa. Why was he there by himself? His sister, Mary Jane, also ended up there and died in 1919. His brother, Abram, appeared to follow him. He was in Colorado until he died in 1930. Were the Lumleys responsible for the article saying Sarah was down in Colorado? Did they try to lure the Philpots down there? so that they could disappear them? Did they keep sending Lumley relatives until they were all gone? After William's death, Victoria Campbell Philpot appears to have come into a large sum of money. She was able to send at least three of her sons to medical school. Where did she get the money? Did she remarry wealthy, or did she just decide to cut all the rest of the relatives out and run with the cash? Now, Victoria's first son was studying to be a minor. That's not a very high and lofty, expensive degree. And this was while William was still living, so it's clear William had no intention to sell the land. Until they found Sarah, they couldn't settle the will for James. So when William died, he actually forfeited his share of the land. His kids would not have been on the will, only William, if there was a will. Now, last I checked, the widow of one of the inheritors can't just word of mouth sell land her husband was supposed to inherit only a part of in Canada from the United States. That's really sketchy. At best, she was being bribed to not return because she was convinced she no longer had a stake in the land. Did she strike a deal with the Lumleys in order to save the lives of her children? Did she abandon the quest of notifying the relatives? Because, hey, it's not her problem anymore. Now, there was actually an interesting story in the Peter Wiley book stating that his mother, G Georgina McGregor Philpott, John Alexander's widow, had died in 1887 due to heart paralysis brought on by eating poisoned cabbage. This was shortly after Peter Wiley visited his grandfather and mother to present his new wife, Jessie. They were both members of the Salvation Army. They had received the telegraph of the widow death while they were posted in Palmerston, about 200 kilometers away from Dresden, where she lived. Shortly after this, the Philpot home burned in 1888. Then the J.L. Lumley store started construction on the corner. Did James's siblings get scared at Peter Wiley's good relationship with James Philpot? And were they trying to remove the widow's claim on Philpot land? Did James or Georgina's two remaining sons find out who really owned the land when sorting out her will and burned the house for the in-laws for retribution for being stolen from their family in 1874? How about the Lumleys? Was their families responsible for the death of Georgina and the burning down of the Philpot family home? Were they trying to appropriate more Philpot lands? Were they trying to ensure nobody would reclaim the lands? that they had appropriated in Clark's name just beside them? Was it the Masonic Brotherhood, whose stolic member was sitting on their lands? Did they want to ensure they could keep it for themselves? 
was it George Eliot Casey? After John A. died, his family appeared as shareholder on the CSR Railroad just before Milton Courtright abdicated his presidency of the railroad. The same railroad that John A. seemed to be heavily connected to. Casey appropriated land in the name of his mother on those Philpott's lands as well. Did he want to intimidate the family into leaving the assets alone? You can see there are many suspects to this murder and fire. In 1892, the Commercial House, a hotel owned by Esther's husband, John Mills, burned down. That was presumably where James's remaining Philpott siblings were living at the time. Was this additional fire related to the previous murder and fire? After Georgina had died and the fire of the family home, Georgina's two boys had moved to the States, so it's pretty clear it wasn't them. What about the Lumleys then? Well, they still maintained a large presence in Elgin, and still do today. Were the remaining relatives removed to ensure their land claims? How about the Masonic Brotherhood? According to the Sims history book, their congregation grew and a larger site was built for them. In 1876, Masonic leader Daniel DeCow was declared insolvent. This is when Sarah disappeared. So it's clear someone was coming after the Masons too. Daniel had also been a reeve of Dunwich at one point, so now we've got a pattern here. Was this in retribution? Or was it a ho just simply a hotel competitor? Again, we'll never know. The crime was never solved. When James Philpot died in 1893, it appears as if no Philpot inherited the lands that were previously owned by their family. What was left was picked up by Lumley's cares. No land in Elgin remained owned by the Philpots, for whatever reason. The Iona Philpot family members had been eliminated one by one. Most of them were wiped out by 1920. Many of them died when a Lumley relative was in close proximity. Were the Lumleys chasing them down to ensure they'd never return for the land? Or were they just going to land appropriate Philpots wherever they could? There were two surviving Philpots, both of children of John Alexander, that remained in Ontario outside of Elgin. One was Catherine Philpot McBean, who we think was protected by her husband's family's association to the famous John A. Macdonald. The other was Peter Wiley Philpot, who was protected by his association to the Salvation Army and the later non-denominational religious congregation he represented, along with the political power this granted him. One interesting story in the Peter Wiley book from the family was that about two years after James had been dead, Peter Wiley was offered a free train trip by a Moncton alderman. This is a politician. A day before the train arrived in Maine, it derailed. Every car except for the one Peter Wiley's family inhabited was tipped over. Luckily nobody was hurt and he shared his car with the other survivors for warmth until they could be rescued. Perhaps the folks out for Philpot lives took this as a sign of God and stopped preying on his religious family. Throughout his lifetime, Peter Wiley never made any attempt to reacquire the Philpot lands. He made his own wealth and through his political connections most of his children married wealthy and found their own success, but not all of them. Perhaps he felt he didn't need to look back. Perhaps he was unaware of what happened there and that he had been theoretically the next in line to inherit this land. Maybe he was totally aware and he just thought it was safer to move on. This year, in 2023, it marks the 130th anniversary of the loss of Philpot lands in Elgin. Do the appropriating families deserve to keep this land? Should it be returned to Philpot descendants? Are they owed financial reconciliation for the crimes against their family? I don't know. You decide. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Musings of Rant. I hope you were as entertained by this crazy piece of Canadian history as I was researching it. Till next time.